This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. The podcast features conversations with musicians and music industry professionals, all intended to help musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. Hey, it's your host, Robonzo here. Thanks for tuning in. If you're an indie music artist or fan, you're in the right place. Whoever you are, I appreciate you. As a gigging musician and fan of live music, I am committed to sharing my personal expertise with you. I'm also committed to learning about and sharing the expertise of other music professionals, which is what I do here on the podcast, extract that expertise. If you'd like to be privy to what I'm learning, hop over to unstarvingmusician.com and join the community. You'll get an email from me, usually weekly, with tips, tricks, insights, and secrets intended to make your music journey a little better and brighter. I'll never send you anything spammy, and you can unsubscribe at any time. If you'd like to support the podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes. The podcast and this episode are powered by the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth Over and Over Again. It was written by me, and it's available on Amazon, Kobo.com, and one day soon, Apple iBooks, when I can finally figure out how to publish it there. The book is also available as a standalone podcast called the Unstarving Musician's Guide Podcast. You can learn more about the book and the companion podcast at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book. I'd love it if you picked up a copy, and I'd love it even more if you left a review. Right. Brian Wolf is lead singer guitarist of the Austin-based rock band Fair City Fire. Their latest album, Shake Your Bones, was released this year in 2018. It is energetic, and I'm guessing it's a fairly good representation of the band's live sound. You can hear the title track at the end of this episode. Brian and I chat about various things related to Fair City Fire, including touring, accolades from the Austin Music Foundation, their Say It Out Loud podcast, and Brian's take on marketing. We also talk about his background in music and how he came to be a full-time player in Austin. We're acquainted only by our time spent putting this interview together, but Brian seems like a really giving person. I am truly grateful to have made the connection with him. Check out his band at faircityfire.com, and that's fair as in F-A-I-R, cityfire.com. You can support the band by picking up a copy of their latest album on iTunes, or you can check them out on the Spotify. Here's me and Brian. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, it's good to be here. It is my pleasure to be here with you, talking to you today. Thank you for reaching out, by the way. I really appreciate that. You know, I wanted to ask you, do I remember that you are acquainted with Ray Prim, or did you just hear him on the podcast recently? I'm uh, more of a fan of Ray Prim. We don't really know each other yet. We've met a couple times, but uh, yeah, I kind of just noticed, um, especially I'm a fan of his Facebook posts. I don't know if you follow him on Facebook, but he is one of the most hilarious people (laughs) on the internet, I think. But yeah, I kind of follow what he's up to, and oh man, he's an incredible musician as well. So when I saw he was on your show, kind of opened my eyes and I hit you up. That's really cool. I so appreciate that. And it's funny, I was sent out an email to my list yesterday that starts out with a typo, but I was saying, you know, one of the cool things about the podcast is I meet someone in Nashville, have them on the show, and then I meet three or four more people, often through introductions. And then I would commented the same things happening right now in Austin. And I think I mentioned that because Ray Prim was someone I wanted to let my list know that I had him on the show. He's from Austin and all that. But Yeah, very cool. And thank you for listening to the show. You had given me some positive feedback simply by saying he was cracking you up. And yeah, I have been following him a little bit more recently. And you may recall when I talked to him, I just was right into you're perceived as a humorous performer, I gathered. But yeah, now that I've connected with him on Facebook after interviewing him, I'm seeing more of the stuff that he posts. And yeah, he's pretty silly. He's pretty silly. (laughs) Yeah, he is. (laughs) Yeah, I love how he kind of makes you look left with his post and then kind of hits you like with like the show promotion at the end. It's just, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm like, Oh man, I got to try that. Try my hand at that brand of promotion. It's pretty funny. Absolutely. Did you grow up in Vestal, New York? I know you spent some of your youth there. Is that right? Yeah. I went to uh, high school there and yeah, I mean, pretty much grew up there. It was actually a little town outside of Vestal called Appalachian that didn't have its own like school system. So, it was pretty much either you go to one of the two neighboring towns for high school. But um, yeah, that's kind of where I grew up. And 
you know, I was in garage bands and stuff back then, learning guitar and all that. So pretty cool. When did you play your first paid gig? Do you remember? I do remember. I was about 14 years old. There was this place in Appalachian called the Smokehouse. And that's now called Ransom Steel Tavern. It's this gorgeous venue. But back then, it was this like real divey hole in the wall kind of place. Just like a place that you probably wouldn't want 14 year olds running around in. But they hired us to play, and a bunch of our friends from school came and they handed us like 200 bucks, which was like mind blowing for a bunch of kids. We're like, oh my God, this is so much money. <laughs> But, you know, obviously things have changed a bit. But it was like, man, to have that gig was kind of like a, whoa, huh, maybe I can make money doing this? I don't know. <laughs> but that was kind of an eye-opening thing. Yeah, I can imagine. I was kind of laughing because I spent my entire teen years playing parties and some of them in front of my own garage. And it wasn't until I was like probably about 25, 27 and these younger guys had seen me and they were starting a new band and they'd been playing in a local club in Arlington, Texas, where I've lived for a long time. And they asked me if I wanted to play with them. So they sort of took me out into my first big gigs and then, but yeah, it took me a long time. It's kind of funny. And meanwhile, a few of my high school friends actually went on to play professionally at a pretty young ages, making serious money in fandom. How did you get started with music? What was it that inspired you to start playing guitar or whatever you picked up first? I started like in school, like a lot of people, like in church actually singing when I was a kid. And then when it came down to time to like, for like fifth grade, it was like you had to choose orchestra, band, or art class. And so it was kind of, okay, I'll do band, whatever. You know, it's like, it's funny, those decisions you have to make when you're a little kid. But I guess for most people, it, it might just be a whatever I did that. But for me, it was kind of like, interestingly, sort of carving what I would end up doing just from a decision that was like, you have to pick one of these. But I ended up playing trumpet and learning on that and kind of led to doing some jazz band stuff in high school. And in the middle of that, kind of decided that I can't sound like ACDC if I'm playing trumpet. So I picked up a trumpet or picked up a guitar at a garage sale that kind of was like an SG model, like uh, Angus Young always played. And it was like a real cheap knockoff thing, like a Japanese brand I've never heard of and never have heard of since. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was cool though. It was just like a, that looks kind of like the devil horn guitar that Angus Young has. So I'm going to try that. It was great. I ended up learning on that, getting myself an amp. And we had a little band. We started when uh, God, we were probably 12 or so in that range and just kind of making a lot of noise in my parents' basement. And yeah, it was good times, man. Your parents were probably thankful they had a basement for you to make the noise in as opposed to my mom, who was very gracious about it all. Me playing drums in the garage. We Basements weren't a big thing in, in Texas. But So when did you find yourself in Austin? I graduated college and my plan was right after college. It was actually to just kind of pursue music because I had sort of, realized that's what I wanted to do while I was in college because there were just some things I was trying to work out with my life and kind of decided to try songwriting to kind of work through that. And it turned out that like the songs that I was writing, people were starting to react to when I'd play them out. And then I realized that's a really good feeling and I want to chase that. And it seemed like Austin was a cool place to go. I had already had some friends in college that just decided to make that move and they already seemed to be doing pretty well. It was either Austin or Nashville, and I sort of already had friends in Austin, so it was kind of like, it took me a couple of years, but I made the move, and in 2012, I've been here ever since. I was going to ask you, too, why Austin over Nashville, and is it because you didn't necessarily play country, and Nashville's so associated with it, but you answered the question, you had some friends? Yeah. Yeah, I've been kind of curious when I talk to people about who were in Nashville or anchored themselves in Nashville versus Austin. And I think growing up in Texas and not being too far away from Austin, I know it's a huge music town and I've seen a lot of noteworthy artists come out of there. I probably don't, haven't learned as much yet about how it is in terms of, I suppose, nurturing or launching careers in comparison to Nashville. But yeah, what a great town. I think if I was faced with the decision of 
doing something like that or decided I wanted to do something like that, I would definitely pick Austin myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I kind of lucked out there. I realized uh, kind of after I knew I wanted to do some kind of move because, you know, as great as uh, Binghamton was, I actually pursued trying to like play as much as I could after college. And we were doing pretty well. We were starting to play some of the local festivals and stuff. And we had all like a bunch of momentum. But then I kind of saw the writing on the wall as far as the big picture of where could I really go if I stayed in Binghamton? And it was unfortunate as much as I, I say Binghamton, but that's the area that Vestal's in. But um, yeah, I kind of saw the writing on the wall and saw that to me, at least the ceiling was kind of low in a small town like that or a um, musician with big hopes and aspirations. So I uh, made that move. Smart one, I'm sure. Yeah, kind of realizing that more and more every day. I really love Austin. And I'm sorry, how long have you been there, did you say? It's been like five and a half years I've been here. Not too long. No. Not too bad. Tell me about the recent gig that Fair City Fire, your band, did at the Linda in Albany, New York. Oh, that's such a cool place. Have you heard of it? I'm not familiar with it. As I was doing a little homework for our conversation today, I saw that gig and it looked like it was kind of a big deal. And the Linda looks like a cool, interesting place with some history. So tell me about it. It's interesting when the, cause we do all, all our own booking and stuff. So it's kind of interesting when tackling booking a place like Albany. You know, there's not a ton of information on the uh, music scene in Albany. And there's also not a lot of bands to talk to that have been through Albany necessarily. This is just one example of a market like that. So it was kind of like, well, let's kind of blanket, just hit up a bunch of places and see what lands. And they were really really cool about getting back to us and they seem to really like our stuff and we get there and with all these sort of like whatever sort of expectations it's a gig and then we walk in and <laughs> we looked out it was it had this like really nice like it was an old bank actually that they converted into a venue and super beautiful place and the green room was actually in the the vault oh that's cool so they they never touched the vault so like the whole like vault door was there and they just opened it and that's where the bands would hang out before their sets (laughs) cool pretty awesome and yeah how did the gig go oh it was great not a lot of people but the cool thing is with that it's attached to wamc i hope i got that right it's a public radio station out of albany that's associated with npr and they actually record all the sets that happen there and play them on wednesday nights on their station so it was kind of cool to find out that like, even though we were playing in this new market where we really didn't know any people and the audience sort of showed there wasn't a lot of people in this pretty big place, but it was still a nice feeling knowing it's being recorded and played later. So we're still going to have an audience in a way. Yeah. It was pretty nice. We had a good time. That's very cool. On the subject of touring, I was reading that you guys did some touring in 2015 and then for the support of your latest release, Shake Your Bones, that you did like a 17-city tour, which I'm assuming this was part of the gig that we just talked about. Can you talk about the differences between the two tours and maybe some things that you guys learned? It's crazy a lot that, you know, that we learned. That first tour, was it was born out of an opportunity that we thought we had in my hometown that was like this big festival. I'm not going to name names or anything, but it was kind of like this big thing that we were excited about. And I brought it up to the guys. We were still a pretty new band. We had just released our first EP and just kind of getting our feet on the ground in the band. But I talked to the guys. I was like, what do you think about playing this festival? That'll probably have a thousand or two people at it. And for a new band, that was just like, whoa, we got to find a way to make that work. And the way to make that work for us was to plan a tour around it. And then it turned into this very big production thing where, I mean, it, you know, at the time it was, it was like, I think seven cities, I believe, and uh, kind of got a taste for it and had no idea. None of us had ever done it before. So we were just kind of just winging it a little bit, not really doing a lot of homework on like what the venues were and stuff. And we got to learn a lot about what to look for in venues and other bands that we choose to play with. Because a lot of it kind of works out at this level where you book the night and then they say, okay, like you guys can play, but you have to find a couple of local bands to play with. That's a little tricky at times. Sure. Because, you know, everybody is trying to make themselves look as good as possible online. You know, it's 
that's pretty much the game. So it's hard to kind of sometimes decipher who's really uh, doing it. But a lot of times the music itself doesn't lie. It's good stuff. It's They're usually going to have a crowd and stuff. So that's what I found. Yeah, that's probably your best determining criteria. And then I'm sure there's other factors that come into play. But you know, I've heard another artist on the show say that when he embarked on his first tour, he was watching what other bands that were kind of in his genre, where they were playing. And he kind of mapped out his wish list of towns to play based on what he saw them doing. And he didn't know these artists, so he was reaching out directly to the venues. Have you guys ever done your homework in that manner? Or I've talked to older guys who are, we were reflecting on a time when he was younger, but has been touring forever and he tours a lot and always has. And now he just doesn't go the great distances he once did. But he said he would always ask the bands that he met. He talked to them about where they were playing, how did they get in touch with so-and-so, or who was someone that they get in touch with. So he was always working the relationships of the different artists that they would perform with and were build with, and then he'd get what he needed to try and figure out how to get into another venue. But are either of those familiar tactics that you guys use in your band to... I know you haven't done a ton of touring yet, but have you done any of that? Have you thought about doing it? Yeah, absolutely. The latter is something that we definitely do as much as possible. And it's the idea of using the connections we've built. It's kind of nice that Austin is such a destination for touring bands because we'll end up getting a lot of fans from all over the place asking us to play sets with them downtown uh, here. Just like, you know, what I said about playing in random cities and trying to find bands, that's what they're doing and they're finding us, which is really nice. But that's a good way for us to meet bands that are doing the same thing we're doing and usually this, a similar genre. So we can get some pretty good insight from just talking to people, which is very valuable, I think. And that's part of what's making us better at doing this and having that available. Yeah, that's cool. Old school marketing still works. Yeah, just talking to people. <laughs> You're one of the few people I realized A, plays in a band as a regular thing. I've talked to a lot of Recently, anyway, a lot of singer-songwriters who are focused on writing and a band situation is not something they're focused on for various reasons, depending on the person. But anyway, not only that, but also you guys kind of genreify yourself in part as a rock and roll band. So that's another thing, which is funny because that's what I've always considered myself a rock and pop player as a drummer. So anyway, it's fun to have you on there and share that with you. What are some of the influences? Is everybody sort of in that area of music influence or are you guys all over the map and it just kind of came together as a rock band? We're super all over the map. It's actually pretty great in that way. I've been in quite a few bands by this point and the big thing I learned from all that experience is like, from my perspective at least, anytime somebody's sort of telling other people what to play, you kind of don't get everything you should out of everybody and people don't feel the same ownership in the music. It kind of, I think, reflects sometimes on the quality an ideal situation, I think, is like what we have. And not to preach, I'm just talking about my experience. What we have is like this group of people that come from a hugely different background musically. And I think it's kind of created something different. And I think that's kind of nice. And in a way, to kind of get into more specifics, our bass player, Brett, is he's a huge hip hop head. Like, that's where he's from. Like, just the whole like 90s hip hop is. That's what you'll find him listening to most of the time in the van. If he's driving, he can pick. That's what we're listening to. <laughs> but it's great. I mean, it makes a lot of sense if you're thinking about bass and, and cool grooves and stuff. That's like some of the best music for that. So it's pretty cool. And you can hear it in his playing. Cause there's these funk elements to what he's playing. And a lot of the hip hop from that time sampled a lot of that stuff. So, Did you know any of the guys before you got to Austin, by the way? Not in the band. I met Clint, who is the latest addition to the band, and opened mic shortly after I moved here. But the other guys, we were in a cover band for a bit together with a different lead singer, and it was going well and stuff. It was fine. We were playing on 6th Street, which is kind of like Austin's like touristy sort of spot, and also like college hangout. I don't know if you ever spent much time on like 6th Street, but at night it's kind of like this like college, just a lot of amateur drinkers hanging out (laughs) but as far as like the music scene goes and trying to get your stuff out there it's sort of tough to be in a cover band in that sort of environment and and thrive and get what you want out of it so and it also wasn't rock it was we were doing a lot of 
poppy sort of R&B stuff, which is fine, but not exactly what gets me excited to pick up the guitar and do this whole thing. So kind of what it came down to was I wanted to start an original rock band, and that's what turned into Fair City Fire, and a couple of those guys wanted to come with me, so it worked out pretty great. Did you guys form in 2015 or before? It was probably late 2014 or so, something like that. I didn't want to forget to ask you this, but so I see that you guys have, so I'm currently a Spotify subscriber, and I say currently because I find myself switching every couple of years just to try something different, and I'm a returning Spotify subscriber, but I saw two of your releases there, but there's another one I think I didn't see. It's an EP that you guys put out called Say It Loud? Yeah. Is that available on some of the services, or and did I just miss it? Is it on Spotify, or is it for sale? I think it's on Spotify. I think it's under, when it's an EP, sometimes they put it under like, the singles part or whatever, so it's not as easy to find. Yep, but, there um, it is. <laughs> yeah, it should be pretty much, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, that was our first EP, and it was like our guitar player at the time knew this guy, uh, Benjamin L. Levy, who had gone to production school and all that stuff and got him to come to one of our first shows, and he really liked what he heard. So it was kind of cool. We had this connection to... Uh, get in the studio pretty early on and get a, a pretty decent deal. And that's sort of what that was. And it was more than anything, just like, hey, let's just do something to capture our sound right now and have it good enough for people to like, maybe consider booking us. <laughs> you know? It's tough to, it's a tough sell without any sort of release out there. That was kind of a, an endeavor. And that's when it started to feel like the band was a real thing when we released our first thing a big move. How do you feel, not so much about the any changes or maybe any quality that you perceive in the band's music since that EP and the latest Shake Your Bones and things in between, but how do you feel about doing full-length albums as opposed to EPs, or are you guys still doing kind of some mixture for marketing purposes? Well, we kind of released a couple of singles last year. One of them ended up on um, the Shake Your Bones album as well. And that was just sort of to kind of like not have too much dead space between releases. But I think in general, it's like when we all talk about how we like to listen to music, it's like we like albums. And it might not be the smartest, most widely accepted form of like promoting your band at the moment. Because, you know, a lot of people, you go ask them for advice that are in the industry. They'll tell you like just release singles or EPs, like smaller releases and have constant contact. And, you know, I think that makes sense, but it's also like part of it is just doing what you want to do. I think a lot of times people sort of forget that sort of stuff and they get into like, what's the smart move? What's the safe move in the industry now? And it's tough when you see somebody do that because you want to be a fan. You want to be really into their music, but it's like, if they're just doing things to be smart and safe, like, and they're not really injecting their personality and their love into what they're doing in that way it's kind of like what is there to latch on to i guess so i think that's a big thing we want to do is like do stuff that we want to do it's a really simple idea but it makes the most sense to us sure it frankly will show itself in the quality of your work when you're doing what you want to do and you know you're just more comfortable that way you're probably as a band more creative that way and as a songwriter yourself so it makes sense to me. And you know what? I'm thinking of another guy that I seem to mention a lot on here, but he is also based in Texas and he's been playing a long time, but I broached this subject with him. He said he's found a combination that's been recommended. So he's still doing albums, but he's got this sort of formula combination of like single EP album, single, single, I don't know what it was, but it was interesting. But clearly he's still, he likes doing the album thing because he just put one out. So... I didn't even know until I was looking, I don't know if I found it on your website or on your Facebook page, but I saw a reference to a podcast called Say It Loud. Is that still going? Yeah, we just recorded our most recent episode on Monday. It was something we kind of put aside till after the tour, and we've been back for almost a month now, so we decided it was time to kind of get back into it. But it's something we started more or less to kind of try to build the Austin music scene in general. We've had a few artists that aren't from here on the show because it's just interesting to us sometimes to get other perspectives. But um, 
it's kind of fun. It's loose too. It's not necessarily a, the interviews kind of go in a lot of sort of different directions, like your show does. But it's a good way for us to get to know other bands in our scene because a lot of times you go to these shows, you're on a bill with with these other bands, and it's pretty much like a hey, that sounds good, and then that's the end of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you know, sometimes you hit it off with bands at shows, but a lot of times it's it very much that's like the extent of the situation, but. You have something like a podcast and people come over and drink a beer and have a conversation about the thing that they love the most, which is playing music. It's a really good way to connect with people, i found. Yeah, I found the same. So I've got to check it out. So I didn't know about it until actually today, but the whole band is kind of hosts or co-hosts the podcast? Well, it's actually um, our bass player's roommate. He's actually a really funny guy, one of the most hilarious people that I know. His name's Matt Jones. He really likes this kind of stuff. Like he's had podcasts in the past and he's trying his hand at doing stand-up comedy now. But he basically he helped us design our website and he came on tour with us to kind of help us out and get some footage and also host this podcast. So it's kind of a nice thing. You know, my role in it is pretty much getting guests lined up and scheduling times when everybody can do it, which is kind of tough at times but he always comes up with the questions and always sort of leads things which is really great because without that it could kind of be i imagine somewhat of a jumbled mess with just people hanging out talking but he kind of has a great way of like obviously letting personality show but reining it in a little bit so the interviews have a direction yeah cool so the band is involved in it but he's kind of a moderator host yeah i would say so pretty much Uh, You know, at least a couple of us. It's not always the full band, but when we can, it is. But obviously, everyone's super busy. It's not always easy to get all four of us in one place. But it's cool when it does work out. But, you know, it's pretty much us, Matt, and then whoever the guest is that week. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you guys are still doing it. And it's an interesting formula with the... Is it Matt that you said? The guy that does the... Yep. Extent, yeah. Matt Jones. Oh, cool. And by the way, he did a great job with your website. I was, I had intended to ask you, who does your website? I love it. <laughs> yeah, he kind of helped us get that set up and stuff, but then we pretty much edited it on our own. But it was like that little push that we needed was from him and just, and him wanted to support us and being a good friend. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. It's a nice gesture. Do you guys have a regular photographer or... Do you just kind of commission stuff out from time to time and sometimes you get some good mobile uploads that you can use? We have this guy out of San Antonio that we really like to use when we can. His name is Micah. He's really great. He actually has this program called uh, Humans of San Antonio where he takes kind of photos of different people in San Antonio and then interviews them briefly and talks. They just share little slices of life about people. There's a similar thing in New York called Humans of New York. I think that's how that whole thing started but he kind of runs the san antonio branch of that it's really neat to see that he's got a great eye We're really thankful to have him what medium does he use for the humans of san antonio is it a podcast or a blog or what is it i believe it's a blog uh, he's got some social media stuff going too i'll have to check that out yeah i'm i don't know which of the photos i'm looking at on the website or are um, his, oh wow, he's got some amazing stuff, but yeah, that's cool, wow. <laughs> if he did all these, a great work. Yeah, you guys have great photography, and I'm commenting on that more and more when I talk to artists, because for me as a podcaster, and I know, well, at least your kind of producer, host moderator dude can relate that working with people who have a nice website or some sort of online presence with nice photography makes a huge difference in being able to promote the episode. So, good job. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In 2016, you guys got recognized by the Austin Music Foundation. I guess you got Artist of the Month like in August. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the foundation and the award. And it was just something that caught my eye. I was like, I don't know anything about that, but I'm interested. So you kind of briefly earlier kind of mentioned not knowing everything about how Austin sort of nurtures they're musicians, but the Austin Music Foundation is one really huge way that Austin does. And it's pretty cool. At the center of what they do, it's kind of musicians that have been doing it a long time at a high level started this thing, and they offer free consulting for 
musicians that don't really have anywhere else to go or anyone else to ask, like, hey, how do I release an album? How do I get my stuff copywritten? Like, it's a place for people to go with all sorts of questions. How do I get booked at this place? And you can go talk to someone for an hour who is really familiar with the Austin music scene. And for us, it's been a really valuable tool. But other stuff they do is they nominate an artist of the month every month and they do uh, different sorts of events around town. And it's really cool. It's a great resource to have in our city. But yeah, they recognized us in August of that year and that was pretty awesome. What a cool organization. It's sort of like a Better Business Bureau for the Austin music scene. It is, yeah. Not even. It's more like, I'm thinking about this place in San Jose, California that I've forgotten the name of. But it wasn't the Better Business Bureau. It was a bad comparison. But it was more of a place for entrepreneurs and people that wanted to start small business. Kind of like an SBA, a Small Business Administration place, volunteers. And you could go talk to them and they'd help you with things like business plans and whatever. But anyway, music focused. What a beautiful idea. And it makes me wonder, does San Jose have anything like that? I've not heard of that. I mean, there are certainly foundations that are doing things like educating people on the blues and performance and what have you. But yeah, that is really, I'm glad I asked about it. And something else you and I talked about prior to hitting record was the business and marketing side of music and as a topic and the fact that you've been playing full-time for three years, I believe you said. And so, yeah, I did want to ask you about a couple of things. Did I noticed you studied marketing in college. So did that help? And the other one is what kind of stuff have you learned along the way, maybe especially things that have helped out in these last three years that you've been doing it full-time that you could share with the listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think having the degree in marketing helped in a way. I think in college, I pretty much learned. I feel like it was sort of gearing more towards like getting a job in New York City and like working for a big corporation and doing that sort of marketing, which is different in a lot of ways than what a musician would be doing to promote their stuff. But I think if if anything, it gave me a, a the mentality of like marketing is very important. Yeah. <laughs> There's like a lot of things on the, behind the scenes that need to happen to run any sort of small business. And that's kind of been a uh, interesting way to look at what we're doing is it really is just a small business. Yeah, obviously it's a little different because we're creating music and stuff. And that's, but in a lot of ways, from a business standpoint, it's kind of similar. And you build relationships in a lot of the same ways with business owners. And that's kind of been the big thing that I would say I've learned is like how important that is, like building these relations with people that you like working with and they like working with you and kind of nurturing those and making sure that you keep those in place. And I think that's a super important part of the whole thing of being able to do it full time for a long time is having those in place. So like if we need a gig, there's people I can call to and it's kind of it's not like cold calling anymore. It's like, no, I've had this relationship with all these places for years now and been able to build a nice little reputation for showing up on time, not being drunk off my ass, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> but <laughs> the you know, that things. kind of stuff that seems simple, but you consistently do those things and prove that you're not their nightmare as far as booking a musician. You know, if you, if you prove that you're professional and you're consistently good, those are things that go a long way. Yeah, definitely. Are there things that you do to maintain and or improve those types of relationships that maybe other musicians haven't thought of or don't do enough of? Anything that comes to mind? I mean, just being present. You know, obviously a lot of the relationships I'm talking about are business owners and uh, people that own breweries or bars that you like playing at. And it's just like going there and being like, When you're choosing where to go on your night off and you want to go out, like that's a good choice is to go there and just kind of reconnect with those people and show that you're not just in it to get their money to perform. It's to go and just be like, you know, Hey, it's good to see you. Like little things just when you do go perform, not just walking in, performing and walking out, like making sure they know that you value being there and you value them as people and, it's interesting, and I think some performers get 
kind of lose that idea that like just common decency goes a very long way. Whether it's the sound guy or the guy booking you, just those little things of just like just making things pleasant that can be the biggest game changer whether you get hired or not. Again, because especially in Austin, just because you're good, that's not necessarily enough. There's a million <laughs> good players here. Oh my gosh. So, I can't even imagine. There's a lot of other things. Yeah, it's great, actually. I like that. It was intimidating at first, but when I kind of started to look at it from like a, well, I better get better than kind of idea, that sort of competitiveness, I think, actually ended up helping me a lot. Sure. Of just having all that talent around. That's funny you mentioned that. I was just imagining making a move to Austin, and one of the first things that came in, jumped in my mind was, oh my God, I'd be so intimidated around all those great players, but obviously it pushes you and then I'm sure it's important not to overfocus on that too and focus on building relationships, finding some players. But on what you mentioned with the relationships with venues, it's I was kinda laughing simply because I sometimes hope or expect that someone like yourself might tell me about some little cool marketing hack that on the surface anyway for musicians might be seem a little sophisticated but highly effective. But almost without fail, musicians, be they journeymen solo artist types or bands, they always come back to the same thing that you just did, which is hanging out, building relationships. And I know that at least my experience has been when I look at friends who play that they sometimes life gives us a lot of reasons that we can't seem to find the time to go hang out at a venue, for instance, like you mentioned. But man, it is so worth it. You're right. It really pays in letting people know that that you care about them as people, as you said. I understand that too. Sometimes things get really busy on our end as well. But you know, it's like, even just that little, if you connect with someone on Facebook that owns a bar that you play at, just send them a message every once in a while. Like, hey, how are things going over there? Like, that's really simple. I mean, it takes two seconds of your time. But mm-hmm. Those are the kind of things that help. Yeah, I don't think there's like any huge tricks to that. As much as, uh, if there are, I don't know them. <laughs> as far as uh, <laughs> marketing yourself. So if you do find some awesome hack, let me know. What we just talked about speaks to the fact that the most important things are being a nice person, an easy person to work with, a reliable person, someone who clearly cares about the work and product that they put out. And all the rest of the stuff sort of comes easy. The rest of it's just mechanical, all the sophisticated stuff. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So That's the other thing, too. There's just a lot of work to be done. And it's not just going and playing. It's, you know, spending a lot of hours. For me, like, I get my most productive work done if I like leave the house and go to a coffee shop and just sit there and just write emails and do promotions and stuff like that stuff is like just as important I think just like making sure that you're up on all that and social media I get help from the other guys in the band on that stuff which is nice but that's a big plus yeah it's definitely not just me doing all the work which is really great yeah I've always advocated why not play with people who have a marketing mindset or at least some of the people in your band because when you're doing it all alone it's just a lot it's it's hard (laughs) so it's great to have a team yeah for sure hey man thank you so much for coming on the show we are going to feature a track from your latest release shake your bones at the end of the episode i know people are going to enjoy that where should people go to find you first online I would say faircityfire.com is a good place to go. But of course, we're pretty up on like our Facebook pages at Fair City Fire on Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to buy the music, Apple, like iTunes, you can stream it on Spotify, all that stuff. We just want people to get it. So Yeah, well, very cool. And love the presence online. Really appreciate you spending time with me today. I look forward to checking out the podcast that you're involved in and checking out more of your recordings, man. So thanks very much. All right. Thanks for having me.
Hey, thanks again for listening. The Unstarving Musicians podcast is edited for sound and content quality by Juan Perez. The intro-outro track is Alarm Clocks, written and performed by Redwood. That's me on drums. Be sure to visit the show notes for this and any other episode for links and exclusive tidbits and offers. You can find them at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. Lastly, visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash resources for cool stuff that I personally use and or recommend to my fellow musicians and artistic types. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell. <laughs>